Namaskaram and good morning to everyone. So this endeavor called uh, Youth and Truth is going to last for some time. And it's our privilege that… Uh, and your privilege that uh, SRCC is the first institution where we are starting. How this came about is, uh, in these many years I've been with people, one constant question that keeps… or regret that keeps coming to me is, Sadhguru, where were you all these days? Why didn't… why didn't we meet you when we were young? Where were you twenty years ago? Why they're saying this is, the nature of life is such, when we are youthful, there's a lot of energy, but no clarity and balance. When they're old, we don't know whether they'll get clarity, but at least they're reasonably balanced. But no energy, what do you do with balance without energy? You know how to balance on the bicycle, but you don't, you don't have the energy to pedal, what's the point? Or you know how to pedal, but you don't have the balance to stay on the seat, what is the point? So, here I am, so that you don't ask me after twenty-five years, where were you Sadhguru? Just to fix that one question. Namaskaram Sadhguru, there is no need of much elaboration as to how much privileged we are to have you amongst us. You can introduce yourself. Uh, so, I am Sri Ram. You were born here? <laughs> <laughs> it so happens. I'm Sri Ram. I'm a third year become on a student. Namaskaram Sadhguru. I'm Pranit from Ludhiana and I'm a second year become student. Namaskaram Sadhguru. I'm Riya. I'm a first year BA economics honor student. Mm -hmm. We all are fortunate to have gotten this opportunity to mediate this event. Uh, so when we say mediate, we no, actually. Uh, mediation comes in only when we have a fight. Hello? We don't so, have a fight, so… So, a lot of people had a lot of questions to ask. And we are… we have tried our best, you know, to kind of shortest them and, you know, put forward whatever is relevant. Sadhguru, all of us sitting in this hall have some goals. And as most of us are students, our goals are at the maximum level. <clears throat> We would like to know, we are very eager to know, when you were of our age, what did… what was that thing which you wanted to become? What was your goal? Oh, <laughs> this is beginning like an interrogation <laughs> Well, frankly I had no goal of any kind, to such a point that uh, my father used to… What will this boy do? He's not interested in anything. But it was completely wrong because I was interested in so many things. I was not interested in the things that he was interested. I was absolutely interested in many, many things. See, when we say goals, we must understand this. From where you are, if you set a goal for your life, you can only set a goal according to your present level of understanding and knowledge, isn't it? You think you have reached a point where you know everything in the universe? So if you set a goal, what kind of goal will you set? a very meager goal. And if you grow rapidly, you will be terribly disappointed with your own goal. But this has been taught to you in the recent years that you must be goal-oriented. If you… Uh, let's say you want mangoes in your house. If you want mangoes, you don't have to think of mangoes. You have to think of soil. 
you have to think of manure, you have to think of water, you have to think of sunlight. None of them look or taste like mangoes. But if you take care of those things, mangoes will come. But suppose you have a strong desire for mango, but you did nothing about growing a mango tree in your home, you will want to steal it from him, if he has. Yes or no? So if you have goals, you… what you're calling as goals is just your desires. And your desires are just an outcome of the kind of thought process that you have right now. The kind of thought process that you have right now is only dependent upon the sort of data that you have collected right now. In twenty years' time of life, what kind of data do you believe you have gathered to set a goal for life? Not necessary. So, this is something that I'm bringing about. Recently, every year we have this business. Uh, we have a business uh, event in the month of November. Many business leaders come, all the top business leaders have been there. Two hundred CEOs come every year to train with us for four days. So last year, one of them was asking me, who's running a major multinational company, Sadhguru, we pick the best from the IITs and IIMs and we keep paying them more and more and they keep asking for more and more. But when I look at your organization, you pay nothing to any of them and it seems to function many times better than our corporation. What is the secret? I said, see, this is all it is. We are devoted to the process. We are not concerned about the goal. We are absolutely devoted to the process. Because of our devotion to the process of what we are doing right now, if you do not do what you are doing right now well, your goal is just going to be a fancy desire, isn't it? Hello? Yes or no? Hello? Your goal is going to be just a fanciful desire that you made up in your mind. And that is not even yours, your goals are all borrowed from ten other people. Whatever is the trend today, that is your goal, isn't it? I would tell the young people, don't set a goal. If you have absolute devotion to what you're doing right now, depending upon the times and the opportunities, we will go as far as we go. But if you're always concerned about the finish line and not the step that you're taking right now, you will fall flat on your face, most probably. If you get to the goal, you will be disappointed. If you don't get there, you will be broken. Most successful people on the planet, I want you to just look at it, don't… don't just go by what I say. Just go on the street and watch people, leave the people who are driving bullock cart and this and that. Just watch those people who are driving BMWs, Mercedes and whatever else, okay? Successful people, just carefully watch them. How many of them are joyfully driving their BMW? Hello? How many of them are joyfully driving their dream car that they worked for? You will see hardly anybody, hardly anybody unless it's a stolen car. <laughs> so those who have gotten to their goals, are disappointed. Those who could not, could not get there are broken and frustrated. What's the point of a life like this? Your ability to do things is enhanced only when you're absolutely, absolutely devoted to the process in which you're involved. I'm using the word devotion intentionally because people think devotion means going to the temple. You tell me, in any field, any arena of life, sport, art, music, politics, spirituality, you name it, whatever you want, academics. Has anybody reached any significant levels of achievement without being devoted to what they are doing? Hello? Has anybody reached mediocre things they have done? Only those who are absolutely devoted to what they are doing, they have done significant things on this planet and that's what you must do. Sadhguru, so uh, as you uh,
told us that uh, goals, uh, like the, those who achieve the goals are, aren't that happy. And those who don't have goals… I thought I'll just scare you a little bit. <laughs> and those who don't have goals are, are also not happy. But goals are the starting point. But a lot of… No, 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 please, let me correct this. Is goal a starting point or a finishing line? Please. Which is it? It's… it's both ways. How is that? How is goal a starting point? Is goal a finishing line or a starting point, please? Please, you must tell me, all of you, is goal a starting line or a finishing line? What is this? Uh, uh, but like if like, goal is something that motivates us to like uh, once we think of ah, a goal in mind… You, you're coming to the point now. So, so, you have been trained like a circus monkey. You know, circus monkeys are like this. If you want them to do a trick, you have to give them a, a sweet. Otherwise, I won't do it. One more little sweet. Don't be a circus monkey. I thought we evolved out of being monkeys long time ago. Hello? So, you're only working. What will I get? What will I get? What will I get? What the hell will you get? You'll die one day, that's all. You think you're going to get something in the end? No, you're just going to die one day. The question is only how beautiful and significant and intense of a life that you lived, that's all there is. What will you get in the end? Goal is the end point, isn't it? What do you think you'll get at the end of your life? I want you to visit old age homes, hospices, where people are reaching the end of their life. Just look at them and see what do you think they've gotten? Nothing. Either they lived a profound life or they did not, that's all there is. Sadhguru, as… Uh, as humans and as… especially youngsters have a lot of desires in their lives. But many a times we all are told that be content with what you have. But like, it comes to my mind that if we are satisfied, if we are satisfied, won't that lead to an end to progress? Whoever told you about be content, I don't know. I don't know what kind of uh, <laughs> teachers you have met who told you be content. Well, the word contentment comes from the word containment. If you think containing your life is an answer, this is simply because you're just shit scared of life. That's all it is. See, if you step out into the world, something may happen to you. Possible? Possible? Hey, are we on talking terms or no? What's the problem here? If you step out of the house, something may happen. Anything may happen. Life may happen, death may happen, injury may happen, terrible things may happen, wonderful things may happen. Yes or no? So, one day something little terrible happened to you. So now, you come to your philosophy, don't step out of your house, something terrible may happen to you. Yes, it may happen, but something absolutely wonderful can happen to you. So if you contain yourself, you can avoid both. Essentially, you are trying to insulate yourself against life. People come to me and say, Sadhguru, please bless us, nothing should happen to us. I say, what kind of blessing is this? My blessing is let everything happen to you. Let everything that's life happen to you. Everything that's life must happen to you. First thing you must decide is, have you come here to avoid life or have you come here to experience life? This is something you must decide. 
Make up your mind, eh? Please make up your mind right now. Have you come here to avoid life or have you come here to experience life? Yeah. Well, if you want to experience your life, this doesn't mean you must get intoxicated. If you want to experience of li your life, that doesn't mean every evening you have to party. If you want to experience your life, you must bring this one instrument that you have to experience life to its highest possible sensitivity. If this becomes super sensitive, this will experience everything in the universe. If you keep it dull and lethargic, you will be right here, you won't know what the hell is happening around you. Yes? So, right now, because people are heavily goal-oriented, they don't know what's happening around them, they are only interested in the finish line. Finish line comes as a consequence of a certain efficient process. Finish line does not come because you desire it. Success does not come because you desire it. Success comes because you do the right things. It will not happen to those who are just desiring it. It will only happen to those who are doing the right things right now. Sadhguru, you have always emphasized on how important clarity is in comparison to confidence or courage. But for people our generation, confidence is something that's at a different level. Even when my nerves were racking to be here on the stage really? with you… Yes. Do I look so dangerous? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, you're safe, don't worry. <laughs> I'm only trying to scare him, not you. <laughs> Each of my friends emphasized on how confident I should be. So do you think that overration of confidence has led to undermining the importance of clarity? Very much. See, confidence means this. Tell me, now the hall is reasonably well lit, if I ask you to walk from there to there, do you need confidence? No. Clarity. No, no. Do you need confidence? No. Why? Because you can see things clearly. If you turn off all the lights, make it pitch dark. If I ask you to walk from there to there, do you need confidence? No. You do. If I ask you to walk in total darkness on the street, don't you need confidence? Yeah. You do. Why? No clarity. So, somebody thought confidence is a substitute for clarity. You do one thing, let's say you can't see clearly, one of the main streets in Delhi you want to cross, how to build confidence? Well, you can say, Jai Sri Ram and run across the street. <laughs> or you can say, Allahu Akbar, or you can say, Hail Mary and run across the street. You may make it. You may make it just by sheer chance or because of the compassion of some driver. But if you try every day, we know where to pick you up. Hello? So I'm asking, is confidence really a substitute for clarity? The problem is like this. Confidence means like this, you take a coin, flip it. Heads I will do it, tails I'll not do it. There are a whole lot of people in the world who are doing this. The problem with the coin is it can… it has only two faces. The problem with life is, it has a million faces. So it… heads means I do it, tails means I don't do it. It looks like it solves your problem. But those who are right only fifty percent of the time in their life, there are only two professions left for them. They can either become a weather person, predicts weather, or you can become an astrologer. In any other profession, you're fired. In any other profession, if you're right only fifty percent of the time, you are fired, isn't it so? Hello? So, unfortunately, we think… See, it happens many times. If you just run across the street, you make it, that's the whole problem. There is an element of chance in life through which you can make it. 
But this is something young people must decide. Do you want to build your life on chance or on your competence? This is something you must decide, very important. You didn't say anything. Huh? On competence or chance? If you even make it by chance, suppose you are successful by chance, you're always insecure and fearful, isn't it? If you made it by, con by your competence, then it's a different matter. If this doesn't work, we'll do something else. If that doesn't work, we'll do something else because we built a competence. But if you're living by chance, then if you make it, you're fearful, you will lose the position. If you don't make it, of course, you know the pain. Sadhguru, nowadays we see a lot of young people are in relationships. So, a public display of affection, PDA, is quite common and popular among the young generation. And it's very normal for all of us to, you know, hug our friends or kiss our partners openly in front of others. But if we say our previous generation, they consider PDA as something vulgar. So, it's very strange that how love offends someone. So my question is that whose uh, outlook do you support? Is it the young generation or your own generation? <laughs> what, what, what makes you think you're younger than me, huh? No, no, I don't agree that you're younger than me <laughs> So, uh, there are many aspects to this question. You said today young people have relationships. Unfortunately, you have come to a place where you think that a relationship means it must be body-based, there must be something biological involved. Biology is a part of our life, but the significance of becoming human compared to other creatures is, they are complete biology, we are only part biology. We have other dimensions to us, we have an intelligence, we have an emotion, we have a consciousness which is of another dimension. Biology is only one part of us. If an earthworm says, I have a relationship and it… both of them tangle each other, I understand. If when a human being says, I have a relationship, it could be a friend, it could be a brother, it could be a sister, it could be a variety of relationships and also body-based relationships. So this thing about using the word relationship only with biological stuff is essentially because somewhere unknowingly, unknowingly, maybe because of internet, you got an enslaved to America. It all started in United States. Relationship means it has to be opposite sex or something sexual. Why can't you hold relationships of other kind? Hello? Are we not capable? I'm asking. Can't we have very intimate, profound relationships with people without fondling their bodies? I'm asking. Possible or no? Biology is not the most prominent aspect of being human. It is there. It's not something that you can, uh, you know, put it under the carpet, it is very much there, but it is not the dominant aspect of being human. With other creatures it is so, with a human being, the most significant aspect of who we are is our intelligence, our emotion, our consciousness. These are big things. Body is just one part of it. I am not saying you must ignore the body, body is there. Now when you say young people, You're talking about those people whose intelligence has been hijacked by hormones. You are… Th <laughs> you… when you were uh, ten years of age, you looked at people, everybody was fine, they were quite okay. You became fourteen, fifteen, you looked at them, every little bump on their body suddenly became a world by itself. Yes or no? 
you have to wait for some more time. When the hormonal thing goes down, then you look at people, again they're all looking normal. <laughs> so, it's not a question of right and wrong, it's not a question of morality, it is just a question of priority. What kind of priority do you want to give to your own bodily compulsions? Now, you will see, in Delhi I've been… last three days I've been seeing, just now when I was coming to your college, somebody in a main street was standing there and urinating. When he feels like it, he does it. What's the problem? Hello? Any problem? No problem, because when you feel like it, you do whatever you want and you think it's your right. He also thinks it is right when he feels like it, he urinates on the street. What's wrong? Dogs are doing it, donkeys are doing it, cattle are doing it, everybody's doing it. Be natural. This is the philosophy you're talking about. I'm saying, there is a certain sanctity to relationships, especially body-based relationships. If you don't maintain that sanctity, it'll become after some time vulgarity, definitely. So somebody is seeing it before you, that if you go like this tomorrow, it'll lead to something else. This does not mean being a moral prude, no. But if you don't maintain that san sanctity, you will regret that how relationships will become, how much pain they can bring in your life later on, you will see. So one… this… you're talking about previous generation, I don't belong to that, nor do I belong to your generation, I belong to the future generations, that's why I'm like this <laughs> The… <laughs> the previous generation that you're talking about was a generation which came just post-independence, you must understand their reality. They lived as an occupied nation for a period of time. Some of them fought, others linked around. Whichever way, their ideas of morality essentially was of their masters. It is British prudery that they carried within themselves, their idea of being right is that, that they must be in two… in a straitjacket all the time. You don't have to go by that, nor do you have to do something stupid in reaction to that. You must conduct your life sensibly. You must conduct your life in such a way that this will work for you for your entire life in some sense. You do something wacky today and there may be a payment tomorrow, so, why don't you think it through? What is the best thing to do? How much of what to do? Hmm? Isn't it? How much of what should I do? How much of our body? How much of intelligence? How much of emotion? How much of consciousness? In your life you must decide which should dominate your life. Accordingly you conduct it, it's fine. Somebody doesn't like it, then he not see it. Sadhguru, now I want to ask you something out of the context. <laughs> so when we all sat for deciding on the questions which we want to ask, a girl came up with something very, very unique which she noticed in you uh, and we felt it is relevant. Why is that wherever you go to, you know, kind of <coughs> preach or talk about stuff, you sit in a particular position, you know? Uh, with sandals removed from your left leg, left leg up and right leg on the ground intact. Is it your style or is it, is it, is it, is it the way that one person should sit? Do you still use the Indian toilet? Yeah, I… Yes. Do you sit in a particular way? <laughs> I'm just asking you, do you? Why? Because the body is made like that. Today, in… Uh, I forget the name of the university, some university in the United States made a study and they said, this is the best way to shit <laughs> because your thighs will go into your abdomen and press it out and everything that needs to come out will come out. 
If what needs to come out doesn't come out, it will slowly raise to your head. Yes. So to perform different types of activity in the yogic sciences, we observed that certain types of body positions will support certain activity to its best. Or in other words, what is called as yoga? What is called as yoga is another different thing. What is called as hatha yoga, the physical postures is, it is about manipulating the body in such a way that you get to a certain geometric perfection that your geometry is aligned with the larger geometry of creation so that you're always in sync, you're never off. And how balanced you are, how clearly you see things and how well you do things simply depends on how much you are in sync with everything else around you, whether it's people or trees or life or just space. Are you in sync with it or not will decide how smoothly, how friction-free is your function in the world. Now, uh, I don't sit like this all the time, only when I speak. How I am sitting, if I have to explain, <laughs> there is something called as Siddhasana. That means, there are many aspects to it. One simple aspect is the left heel. The left heel is… there is a point on the left heel that today the medical sciences are calling, as a, calling it as the Achilles. You heard of that? You heard of the man? Achilles? You heard of the man? You saw the movie? You didn't see the movie? Troy? You didn't see? Very innocent boy. So, you put your Achilles to what is called as Muladhara or the perineum in your body. If these two things touch, many aspects are cleared out in you for that period of time. Many aspects means your thoughts are clear, your emotions are out and there is a very clear perception of what's happening around you. You heard that Achilles was killed because an arrow was shot to his heel. You don't believe if somebody hurts your heel, you will die, isn't it so? But Achilles died that way. And there's another person who died that way in India, way before him. Yesterday was his birthday, Krishna Janmashtami, he also died this way. What this is trying to tell you is, they, dry, they were killed in an expert way, not just slitting your throat or breaking your head, but just putting a point at the Achilles so they had to die. So there is a certain system, energy system in the body, if that point of Achilles is in touch with your muladhara, when you sit like this, there is a certain balance that you don't take any sides. See, all of us have our own opinions, ideas, ideologies, stuff, our own experiences of life. Your own experiences of life and imprints that you have taken in your mind influences everything that you see. You like this person, you don't like this person, you love that person, you hate this person. All this is because you're constantly taking positions of your own. But if you really want to know life, the most important thing is you don't take any position, you're willing to look at everything fresh every moment of your life, absolutely fresh every moment of your life. This is very difficult for people to understand. People who have been with me for thirty, thirty-five years, every day they are with me, working with me, doing so many things. I still don't have a single opinion about them. Only when I did need to do some work, I may look at their competence and stuff, but I don't have a single opinion about anybody who is around me for such a long time. By now you should have formed your opinions, but I don't because that is the essence of spiritual process that we constantly looking at every life as a possibility. There is of course a distance between possibility and reality. Some will have the courage and commitment to s travel that distance, some will not have the courage and commitment to travel that distance. But every life is a possibility. If you want to keep that possibility open, you never ever form an opinion about anybody of any sort. Good, bad, ugly, you don't form these opinions, you simply look at them right now. How are they right now, this moment? That's all that matters to me. 
how you were yesterday is not my business. How you may be tomorrow, let's see. Tomorrow must be created, not concretized right now, isn't it? It's a certain geometry of the body. If you manage the geometry of the body well, you must… I'm telling you, right now people, uh, the Western cultures are going about propagating yoga is another stretching exercise. Instead of that you can do pilates, instead of that you can do boxing, instead of that you can play tennis. See, if you want to be just fit, go run somewhere, climb a mountain, play tennis, do something. Yoga is not about fitness, fitness is just one consequence. The important thing is to get the right geometry of life because physical universe is all geometry. Now this building is standing here, whether how long it will stand, whether it will fall on our head today or will it stand for a long time, essentially depends on how geometrically perfect it is. The same goes for the body, the same goes for the planetary system, the same goes for the universe, the same goes for everything. Planets, planet Earth is going around the sun, not with a steel cable attached to it, just perfection of geometry, isn't it? If little off geometry, if it happens, it's gone forever. And that's true with you also. If you go off your fundamental geometry, you are gone. It's very important at an early age, you do the right things to bring a right sense of geometry. Now, you become competent to go through life. Those people who are thinking only good things should happen to them, obviously they're unfit for life. Because if you do not know how to go through harsh situations well, joyfully, then you will avoid all possibilities, isn't it? You will avoid all great possibilities of life simply because you want to avoid a little bit of difficulty. Only when you're geometrically in a certain state of congruence, then you're willing to go through any situation no matter what it is. Sadhguru, jealousy is always considered as a really cynical emotion. But to be honest, for me, it has worked so well. <laughs> <laughs> what did you get to do? Uh? It, it motivates me. <laughs> so every time my friend learns something new, I just get this innate urge to perform better. And it's probably why I've landed up in my dream college. So do you think that jealousy is actually a negative emotion or does it motivate you to do better? See, uh, these days, fortunately, it's gone. When we were growing up, especially Diwali is coming, when Diwali comes, in small towns, one of the fun that people have is, they will make a can full of, uh, what to say, the firecrackers and tie it to a donkey's tail. When it goes dum dum dum, poor donkey runs all over the place faster than a horse. You think that's the way to motivate life? There are better and more intelligent ways of doing things. Well, when you feel like your tail is burning, you may run. People always use this thing, if a dog is chasing you, you will run really fastest. But Mr. Bolt, you know Mr. Bolt? He did not run because his tail is on fire. He runs because he prepared his legs and lungs in such a way, whichever way he runs, he's faster than everybody. Hello? Isn't that the way to run? You want to run because a dog is chasing you? You want to run because your tail is on fire? Is it the way you want to run? No, that's not a pleasant way to run. See, one thing is important that you run fast. Another thing is that your experience of running is fantastic. Isn't that important? Hello? Well, you got into your dream college, but it could be hell, three years, three years of hell, who knows? Is it not important that these three years are a fantastic experience for you? Huh? Not important? <laughs> Running is not the only important thing. How you experience it? What comes out of it tomorrow? Suppose we ran because our tail is on fire, now we understand. The only way to make people run is to set their tails on fire how much damage we will cause to everybody. 
And I've seen these donkeys running faster than a racehorse because they're terrified. That's not the way to run. Please don't do that to yourself, not anymore, okay? Now the dream has come true. <laughs> Sadhguru, now that we talked about her dream college, I take the leverage of putting you in a situation. Uh, it's okay, you were born here, so it's all right. You know. <laughs> Suppose you are a third year student at SRCC. So most of the third years would join me uh, in the mindset that this is the time, you know, where we have a lot of options. We can opt for placements or we can do higher studies or we can do, per we can pursue CA, etc, etc. But at times it happens that our vision or our goal about life is different from that of our parents. Have you ever come across a situation where your goals are not in line with your parents and sure. is it okay to, you know, kind of go against them? See, they had goals and goals, I had none, so I never came across such a thing. <laughs> they had many goals. So, uh, my father being a physician, he's a very good man and academically all his life he's been at the top. And he's a physician. In India, we have a malice that First thing is you become a doctor. If you cannot, you become an engineer. If you cannot, then, then only you end up in commerce <laughs> At least in the previous generation. <laughs> in the… when we are growing up, that is the thing. So, obviously his dream is I should become a doctor. I hope he does… he's not on the web listening to me. because he… he studied in such a way that he didn't study because for him it was a passion. He lost his mother when he was four years of age and she died of tuberculosis. So though he's from a very large business family, he committed that he will become a doctor because somewhere a four-year-old boy felt that if there was a good doctor, the mother would have lived. So he committed that he wants to become a doctor. For him, being a doctor was not a profession, it was like his religion. He… he lived like that. So naturally, he wanted all the four siblings, all his four children rather, to become doctors. First one didn't become, sec second one didn't become, third one didn't become, I got caught. At the age of ten or eleven, I clearly told him, see, one thing is I'm never going to be a doctor. Please don't pin your hopes on me. He showed me all his notes, piles of notes that he has kept about his studies. And he said, I've kept all this so that one of you will become a doctor. Well, all three went different ways and me going nowhere. I'm only interested in biology means I'm interested in the jungle, not in dissecting something just looking and absorbing things. So, a time came when I finished my… this is… this is not a good example, you're asking me questions, okay? I finished my… Uh, what is today called as plus two, is it? What do you call this? Hmm? Twelfth. At that time it was called as pre-university course. I finished my twelfth standard, Mm, and uh, I decided I will not go to the university. By then I had cycled across southern India. I had seen more life than most people would have seen. I had done some small tradings of this and that and earned a lot of money. Lot means in those days a few thousand rupees. Maybe I had fifty, sixty thousand rupees when I was seventeen years of age all rolled up, I didn't know what's banking, so rolled it up and put rubber bands and hid it all over so that my brother doesn't steal. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have a lot of money and I have a bicycle and I want to go to Moscow on my bicycle, I'm preparing for that. So I'm not going to the university for sure. In this family, you 
if you fail, there's an advantage, you don't go to the university. If I knew that, I would have just failed. But the problem is I had passed. So I said, I won't go to the university, I will educate myself. He said, what? Not going to the university? I said, no. Then uh, once I said, I'm not going to the university, suddenly I became such an evil in the family, everybody started looking at me, what is wrong with you? I said, well, I want to educate myself. How are you going to do it? I said, I think I'm doing it pretty well. But if you insist that I must read and study, then I decided that one year I did something very unique and uncharacteristic of me. That one whole year, just to handle the reaction I got, I wanted… I couldn't understand what are they reacting to? I don't want to go to the university, what is their problem? First of all, I never understood why I should go to the university. Nobody ever told me why I should go to the school. So I went to the Mysore University library every day. When the library opens at nine o'clock, I was there, I was the first customer. When it closed at eight o'clock, I was the last one to get out. Those days, these days many of you are well fed and like that, we were also well fed, but our activity was such, the level of activity was such, I'm always hungry. I would actually eat at that time at least ten times more than what I'm eating today, at least or much more. <laughs> so I'm always hungry, doesn't matter how much I eat, I'm always hungry because my activity levels are such. This one year I went without a lunch, it's not a small thing for you, you can easily go without a lunch. <laughs> but for me who was scrawny and a concave stomach all the time, going without lunch for one year was like a big feat. I just read anything to anything. You know, from Kalidasa to Homer to popular mechanics to, to a whole many, many years of National Geographic and all kinds of books of physics, mathematics and astronomy and you take whatever. One whole year, every day, eleven hours a day, I read and read and read. That's the only reading I did. After that, me and books don't go. Then after one year, I realized that just gathering all this information is just waste of time for me. And uh, when the next academic year came, uh, there was drama at home. My mother was crying and said, what are you wasting your life for? We thought you will become this, you will become that. I said, I don't know what I'll become, but she put so much pressure, just get into some college. Whether you go there or not, I will not ask, just get into some college. Then I thought through this and I said, okay, I'll do literature, English literature, because in this one year I had de developed some appetite for reading literature and poetry. And I myself was writing many, many poems about just about anything. So I joined literature. I went to college, and first day, a teacher comes and reads a book. Everybody is writing down, kara kara, these days it doesn't make noise, those days fountain pens, kara 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 kara, fifty people are writing kara kara. I don't like this. I said, see, I just looked into the teacher's book, then I saw it is a handwritten book that it's her notes. I said, ma'am, if you give that book to me, I'll make photocopies of this and give it to everybody. You don't have to come, we don't have to come. <laughs> but if you want me to come here, I have a thousand questions. Not thousand, I have millions of questions like a dark cloud, it's hanging around my head. I'm going to ask these questions. If you cannot answer these questions, I cannot sit here. Then I made a deal with all the teachers that they give me attendance and I won't bother them with their questions. <laughs> this deal worked pretty well for three years and I got out. Is this what my father wanted? Definitely not. Why I'm saying this to you is not to simply go against your parents, that's not the point. The point is, 
this life is precious. Now when you're talking about what shall I do, shall I do this, shall I do that, is it only about how to… how to earn a living? You must get off that. This is not about… education is not about earning a living. When an earthworm can earn a living, a grasshopper can earn a living, every damn insect, bird and animal can earn a living, a street dog can earn a living, what is the big deal about survival with such a big brain? Survival is not the big thing about the human being. Survival has become a problem because you want to survive like somebody else, that's a whole problem. If you want to survive, it's not a problem. My father would ask, how will you make a living? How will you live? What will you earn? I said, if I… if nobody wants to feed me, I'll go into the jungle. And I went into the jungle for weeks and survived very well by myself. Many times I went off into the forest and I just survived off the forest without any food support from anywhere else. So survival is not the issue. What are we going to do with this life? Are we take… going to take this life to full potential or are we going to be those people who are just shit scared of life itself and what will happen to my food, what will happen to my food, what is this? When a street dog is not bothered happily, is wagging his tail and going tuk tuk tuk, what is your problem with such a big brain, I'm asking? You don't educate for survival. You educate because you want to expand your horizons. You want to make this life into a worthwhile life. That's what that matters. So will it be in conflict with many people? Of course it will be because they think you won't make it. I must tell you this now that you asked this question. This was uh, almost thirty-four years ago. There was a person who was like a godfather to my wife at that time. She was still working in a bank. I was on my… living on my motorcycle, traveling all over the place. I would teach here and there once in three, four months, but rest of the time I'm just riding simply riding across the country for no purpose. So one day I came to Bangalore and I went to their home because of the entire night I've been riding. I went to their home and I wanted to shower and have some food and then go pick up my wife from the bank. Then I showered and ate well and then this man sat in front of me and said, See, I know somebody in the Bangalore Development Authority, in this particular extension there are some house sites available, you must get yourself a house site. I said, what? Me buy a house site for what? I live on the motorcycle, why will I buy a house site? He said, no, you're married, you can't be like this, you need to have a house someday, you must buy a house site. I said, don't you tell me this, that if I wanted to buy real estate, I wouldn't buy a house site, I will buy a town, okay? <laughs> so that's not my interest at all. I'm not going to buy a house site, please don't try to push me. Thank you for the meal and the shower, but then he looked at me hopelessly and asked, how long will you go on like this? I said, as long as my marbles roll, that's about it. That's how… that's how long everybody goes about in their life. Then I went out and I didn't see… and I said, met him here and there. For about eighteen years I had not met. In 2017 <laughs> see the problem is just this, people recognize… Uh, people value something only because it's recognized by somebody. That means they're blind, isn't it? If you look at this, you must know this is light. You look at this and you don't know what it is. And I said, see, see, that is light. That means what? You're blind, isn't it? Yes or no? So after eighteen years of no contact, he called me in 2017 because the central… Uh, the government gave me this Padma Vibhushan. He called me and he said, I never thought your marbles will roll this far <laughs> okay. So unfortunately, a whole lot of people can see light only when you say it is light, otherwise they can't see it. Don't go by such people, whoever they may be, doesn't matter who they are. So, uh, 
expression of opinion and uh, expressing yourself out is a fundamental right given to all the citizens of the country. And uh, we youngsters born in the era of social media are not at all hesitant about expressing our opinions on social platforms or with anyone. But uh, there are times when, you know, because of we expressing our opinion, we might hurt someone's sentiments or other people might get offended by what we say. So in such a situation, how a youngster should use the tool of social media and expresses his opinion so that in a very uh, balanced way, so that no one is hurt? So one important thing, I was also telling, telling the Twitter people and yesterday I think they tweeted about it because I spoke about it day before yesterday, is this. See, today it's now 280 characters, not 140. In 280 characters, some of the world leaders are expressing the policy of the nation, all right? They're even setting foreign policy agenda of the nation, major nations, in 280 characters, Twitter. So I was telling these Twitter people, see, what you guys are missing, just for the numbers, you're missing something tremendous. Tomorrow, the entire world may set its agenda and policy on the Twitter, but that will not happen simply because for seven billion people you have fifteen billion accounts, because most of them are fake. People who don't have the courage to put their name out and say, oh, this is what I want to say, such people are slinks. This is not opinion, isn't it? This young people must do. You can say what you want, but you must have the courage to stand up and say, okay, this is what I will say. Not hide under the chair and say something loudly. What is the point of such a life? What is the point of such an existence? Is it not important that whatever you say, you are accountable for it? Hello? Huh? Is it not very important? All of you who are managing face, false, fake Facebook accounts, Twitter accounts, take it away, put your name out there. This is me and this is what I say. You like it, you don't like it. If you don't like it, please tell me, I will look at it. Yes? If you don't like it, you explain to me why you don't like it, then I will consider. But you don't even want to put your name on it, but you want to express your opinion all over the world. No, you have no right to do such things just because you have technological tools, okay? I can't stand behind this board and shout something at you. If I want to say something, I must be able to say it to you, isn't it? Unless people are responsible, without responsibility, you should not claim an authority over everybody's life. I don't have authority over your life to just say whatever I want about your life and what you do. If I want to say, I must take some responsibility for that, isn't it? If this is brought about, everybody can say what they want to say. Only thing is, you're talking about if it hurts somebody, see, let's understand this. Speech, communication. Speech is communication. Communication between who? Two people. Isn't it so? Two groups of people or two individuals or whatever. When I'm speaking to you, is it not important? Whatever I wish to say, I can say. Is it not important? I respect your position and I'm willing to listen to what you say and then I will say strongly whatever I want to say. I will say it very strongly, see, look at me. Uh, what I say, I will say it very strongly. But I am not even willing to listen to you, that is not acceptable. That is not at all acceptable, but right now that is the instrument social media has given to people that they can say what they want and they don't have to listen to anybody. If you say something, they will abuse you. Abuse is also language, isn't it so? Shall I use it right now on you? Do you want it? Do you want to be abused by anybody? So if you don't want to be abused by anybody, you must understand nobody else wants to be abused too. Just that. <laughs> Sadhguru, uh, 
so you have built such a huge adi yogi statue at your ashram and whoever visits that place are in awe of that particular uh, statue so do you think nowadays in the current scenario things has to be done in a you know mass scale to get noticed there's only one how is it mass there's only one statue how is it a mass uh, so it it is built in such huge form the size yeah see what is big and small is according to people's perceptions all the people in the yoga center they say sadguru we should have made it little bigger it's looking so small compared to the mountain behind so what is small and big is always people's perception but there is something called as visual impact of all the five sensory organs that you have of seeing hearing smelling tasting and touching tell me if i tell you suppose i am going to take four of these away from you right now which one would you like to keep just the nose or just the tongue what would you like to keep this is your option four you have to lose one you can keep which one will you keep everything is important everything is important but you are going to lose four you must learn to you must learn to exercise those options because life is like that it won't let you keep everything something you have to lose so four you have to lose which four will you want to lose and which one thing you want to keep can you just tell the five either i'll take off your eyes or your eardrums or your tongue or your sensation or your nose which one thing you want to keep tell me <laughs> eyes of course because of the five sensory impacts that you have upon you visual impact is the largest impact for you right now but let us say you were a dog i'm not saying i i don't think dog is anything derogatory i think it's a great animal if you were a dog if i asked you this question you would say nose because his food his survival happens because of his nose but for a human being the visual impact is the largest impact so in that sense it is not about the size of the adiyogi it is about the geometry to get the geometry perfect in a small size is extremely difficult extremely difficult so we needed a certain amount of size to get the geometry easily in place the geometry of our yogi now that you ask this question is to exude see when i say geometry of your yogi will exude something is it true you went home today and your father was sitting in a certain way just by looking at his posture you know whether he is angry or happy unhappy disturbed do you know or no so the geometry of adi yogis we wanted this to exude three aspects one is exuberance of life another is stillness of life another is intoxication i worked for two and a half years to get this face right many 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 faces were made then we decided we need a certain size and that size became over 80 feet when it became over 80 feet then we thought the number also has to have some significance so we went for 112 feet because adi yogi when he propounded the ways the different ways in which a human being can attain to their highest possibility he gave 112 ways so we made it 112 feet it would have been 87 feet but i thought if you're going 87 what is the problem we'll get it to a place a number that he likes so it became 112 feet but we wouldn't have been able to achieve the geometry of what we wanted in less than 88 to 80 to 90 feet it wouldn't be possible that's why it's 112 feet so sadguru you are so reverent and you are so cherished do you ever get a superiority complex right now yes <laughs> see uh, 
The question is not about superiority complex, inferiority complex, poverty complex or wealthy complex. That you have a complex is a serious problem, isn't it? Whatever kind it is, what a complex means is, you have assumed something about yourself and you have concretized that assumption. In such a way, you make a bloody fool of yourself wherever you go. Do I look like that? Hello? Do I look like I'm making a bloody fool of myself with you? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, <laughs> no complex of any kind. But then our confidence fluctuates every day, so what do you have to say about that? Because I don't have any confidence about anything, I just have clarity. People think I have knowledge. No, my head is empty. That's why to make it little look… look little substantial, I have a turban. <laughs> it's totally empty always, but I have clarity. Clarity means what? You see things the way they are. Knowledge means what? You have fixed information about everything. If things have changed, you will not see it the way it is. That's as good as being blind. See, people think owls are blind. It's not true. Their vision is far more sensitive than yours. But because of sunlight, they're blinded because it's too much. Suppose, what is the power of your glasses? 3.4. 3. Let's say we will put 10. If you put 10, if you look at these lights, you'll feel dazzled. That's what is happening to an owl in the day. When light goes down, he sees very clearly. Not because he's blind, because his eyes are super sensitive. So, it's important that you bring clarity to your life, not knowledge, because knowledge is conclusions that you gather. Knowledge is okay when you're trying to do something physical, material in the world, but not with life. Is it true what you thought was absolute at the age of twelve, today is not true? Yes or no? Are you sure that whatever you think is this is it right now, will be this is it in another three years' time? Of course not. You know that, so you know you're wrong. <laughs> yes or no? So you know, anyway you're wrong. So why assert the wrong things? Well, right now we are wrong, at least let's manage with little… little more conscious. If you know you're wrong, you will walk carefully, isn't it? Hello? But you… you think you're absolutely correct, then you will do stupid things and you blunder around the world. If you know you're not seeing properly, will you walk carefully or no? If I ask you to walk through a dark room, suppose we turn off all the lights and close it down, everything, pitch dark, if I ask you to walk, suddenly will you become super alert and conscious as to how you walk? But when the lights are on, you're just going unconsciously bumping into everybody. So if you learn to walk every moment, like there are no lights and you're looking at everything absolutely carefully, then what you see clearly, you go through it, what you don't see, cl see clearly, you hesitate. Some places you take a little bit of chance, but if you are just confident, you will blunder through life, we don't know where you will get in and what you will get trapped into. Most people are trapped into their professions, their family situations, their social situations in such a way, they all became like this. Yes, already I'm seeing not just older people, youth have become like this. What will happen to me at the end of my life? What will happen to me at the end of my life? I'm already revealed the secret, you will die. Hello? But Sadhguru, if this happens, what to do? If that happens, what to do? All those things will happen. It's not that everything will happen in your life the way you like it. Things will happen in the way you don't like it. It once happened, Shankaran Pillai got fired from his job. Simply because he asked a question, 
smoking or not smoke, non-smoking. How can you get fired for asking such a simple question? Smoking or non-smoking, he asked and he got fired. Because what he was supposed to ask was cremation or burial. <laughs> not getting it. So, many times what you do, thinking I am right, may be irrelevant to the situation in which you exist. So the most important aspect of your life is you're relevant, not right. You're just relevant to the existing situation, you're relevant. I am right, I am right, I am right. This is confidence. You being right, nobody cares. All the idiots who think they're right, nobody wants to listen to them, nobody wants to be around them, isn't it? People who always think, I am right, I am right, you want to be around them? No, the important thing is you're relevant to the situation in which you exist. If you have to bring relevance into your life, you must extinguish your confidence and bring clarity. To develop clarity, there are many systems. See, to develop your muscle, there are systems, isn't it? Similarly, to develop clarity, there are many systems. Unfortunately, our education system is dulling clarity in so many ways. Some of the research studies in the university shows that if a child goes to kindergarten and goes through twenty years of education, I'm sorry, I'm saying this in an educational institution, twenty years of education and comes out, let's say, with a PhD, they are saying seventy percent of their intelligence is irrevocably destroyed. So you have a knowledgeable idiot. What do you do with this? Well, you can… you can impress people by throwing information, but this whole game of impressing people, throwing this information and that information around is all going to go because that Google lady is better than any of these idiots. Hello? You… Uh, it's, uh, it's really amazing, I am uh, just traveling to wherever, let's say I'm flying to United States or Africa or somewhere, I just ask, uh, you know, what is the morning temperature in Entebbe? I'm landing there. Without batting an eyelid, in two seconds, she tells me it's fourteen degrees centigrade and by afternoon it's eighteen degrees centigrade, by evening it's again twelve degrees centigrade. Who could ever see this? Hello? She may not be perfectly right, but she's almost there. So people who are carrying a basket of information on their head and feeling superior, I want you to understand this in this country and everywhere else in the world. In the… not the previous but the previous generation, somebody who could read a book was seen godlike because everybody else was illiterate. And people thrived simply because they can read the Gita or the Bible or something else. They thrived simply because they can read. But once everybody can read, we are ignoring those people completely. Yes or no? Hello? You are falling asleep, I think. <laughs> this is not a commerce class. <laughs> so, People who are carrying information and feeling superior, they will all be made into nothing in the next fifteen to twenty years' time. Once artificial intelligence becomes all over the place, information will mean nothing because it will be available everywhere. By then you must be competent to do something beyond information. This is why I am with you. <laughs> Right, so now before we open the session for our audience to ask you questions, we have some really popular questions from various social media platforms. Whoa. Now, so the people who could not join here, so they've sent us the questions uh, through various social media platforms and the first question, I'll read it out. Sadhguru, you mentioned that you Who is can... this? Who is this? Anonymous person or… Uh, yes. I will not answer anonymous questions. They must at least say this is my name. 
have their names. Okay. Okay, okay. So, but we'll definitely get back to you. I believe you made up the question and it's okay. <laughs> no, that's what I'll assume because you're not telling me the name. Please. Sadhguru, you mentioned that you can do fourteen different activities at a given moment. So, we all are very curious to know how can we achieve such prowess over both body and mind? Oh, whoever said this, I didn't say anything like that. Anyway, do you have a liver? Yes, I do. Functioning? Yes. Do you know how many levels of activity it's doing right now? What the liver is doing is far more complex than what your brains are doing right now. Do you know this? Yes or no? A brainless liver, if it can do so many things, a brained pranit or whatever, pranit, pranit, how many things? No, I was only talking about not activity per se. Yes, activity is also possible. So you must understand this. On a round planet which is spinning right now, hello, is it? Are you on a round planet? Spinning? Most people don't understand this unless, uh, you know, they get sozzled out with something or uh, they get some ailment, that. Either a few drops more or a few drops less between the years. Suddenly you see, planet is round. Do you know how complex an activity it is for a human being to walk at a certain latitude on a round planet which is spinning and which has magnetic forces working upon you all the time, it's an extremely complex process. You ask a child who is, let's say, one year of age, he knows how complex it is. Have you seen? But the moment you learn to walk, you assume that it's nothing, walking is nothing and you're sick of walking, you want to drive a car, you want to ride a motorcycle. But walking is such a complex process, not fourteen. A thousand different functions, your knees and your brains and the fluids in your body, all of them are doing all the time. If only you could conduct these things consciously, you would be, a, you would be doing a thousand things. Anyway you're doing it, but if you could conduct this consciously, you would do a thousand things at a time, isn't it? So I was only talking about different channels of mind, which you don't have to actually conduct, you just have to initiate and leave. It will go on for you to think about your neighborhood girl, do you have to initiate action every time? No. If she's pretty, I'm saying. Once you look at her, it just goes on by itself, isn't it? Why? Because you're drawn to it. If you're drawn to ten different things at the same time, mind is capable of creating ten different channels and keep it running. So, there is an entire process. Right now, I think uh, one Jain monk, somebody, a sixteen, seventeen-year-old boy, you heard of him? He's in the newspapers. Uh, how many things can he do? Anyway, <coughs> there are people in small towns in Tamil Nadu who are called Shatavadanis. That means they can do one hundred things at the same time. A complex mathematical problem, a sensation, a music, some raga, this, that, hundred things at the same time, because that is how complex human mind is. This complexity you can use either to drive yourself crazy with unbridled thought and emotion, or if you harness it, it can do things that nobody has imagined possible. It can do things in a miraculous way. You can manifest things in a phenomenal way if the necessary training goes. See, is it not very clear to you, if somebody is walking there, if you just look at them, how they are walking, you can make out whether they are physically fit or not, yes or no? Body has been worked upon, you can see it or no, just by the walk. Similarly, whether the mind has been worked upon or not, whether your energies have been worked upon or not, is something that's visible. Most people may not see, but if you pay attention, you will see. 
Right now, most human beings, the problem is we gave you a super, super, super computer. The most sophisticated machine on this planet is this human mechanism, isn't it so? I am asking you, have you read the user's manual? Hello? No. When are you going to read it? On the last day? When I see this ridiculous stuff, people reading Gita when people are dying, I say, you're reading the user's manual on the last day, what's the point <laughs> If you buy a phone, should you read the user's manual in the first three days or after three years when you want to get rid of the phone? Huh? You must read it in the first three days. So I'm not asking you to read a scripture. Well, this is a living scripture. Should you not become competent to read the scripture, understand what is the nature of this, what is the full potential of it and explore this? Because this life is not about this or that. This life is about this. Yes or no? There is no choice about this. It is just that you can enslave this life to something else and think it's about that. But actually it's about this, isn't it so? Are you okay with this? You think right now your life is about education. No, your life is about this. You want this one educated. You want this one to do well. You want this one to experience love. You want this one to experience pleasure, you want this one to do all this. All the other things are only attendant things. This is the real thing, isn't it? So if this is the real thing, is, does this deserve some amount of attention? Some amount of attention means not standing in front of the mirror and attending to your skin endlessly. Should you not pay attention to every dimension of what this human being is made of? What makes this life tick? And how? If you understand what makes it tick, you can make it roar. If you make it roar, why fourteen things? You can do many more. Hmm? Guru, the next question which we have, uh, I'll just read it out for you. Uh, it is believed that Srinivasa Ramanujam could write mathematical equation as is he had access to the whole universe. He also says that God has dicta dictates him those mathematical ideas. How can I reach to that state? That is the question. First you must find a goddess, huh? <laughs> you interested in this question? Hello? I want to hear whatever I hear loudly, I'll go by that. <laughs> no. Nose. Nose coming late. Yes came strong. <laughs> All of you, do you use a phone? Yes, sir. Why? Why do you use a phone? Why did we first of all make a telephone? Because we can speak. If we had no ability to speak, would we manufacture a microphone, a telephone, any of these things? Hello? Why did we come up with a bicycle? Because we can walk, but we wanted to walk faster, so we ran. We ran and we knew there's a limit. We wanted to go faster than that, so we came up with a bicycle. Suppose we were made like a tree, rooted to one place, would we have invented a bicycle? No. So a telephone, a telescope, a microscope, Bicycle, automobiles, airplanes, everything what? What faculties we already have, we want to enhance that. We have not come up with any machine for which we had no faculty and suddenly we came up with something because we don't even know what those things are. Yes? The faculties that we do not have, 
we have no way to perceive that whether it exists or it doesn't exist. Only faculties that we have, we are trying to take it for. So in this effort, we came up with many machines. All machines here are only enhancing our existing faculties. They have not come up with any absolutely new faculty. In the same context, right from ancient times in this culture, we came up with machines not made of material, not made of mechanical process, but an energetic process. What does a machine with an energetic process mean? See, suppose, suppose somebody is dead. You seen any dead people? Hello? Where did you see? I never saw. You saw dead people or dead bodies? Ah. Dead body means what? Let us say no accident happened, no murder happened, no nothing happened or let's say somebody just suffocated and died. If somebody suffocated and died, heart is in the right, heart is doing well, maybe not beating but it's fit, liver, kidney, dam, everything is all okay. Only thing is, the person is not alive. All the mechanical parts are okay. Only thing is, that life energy is missing. So this is also an energy machine on one level, isn't it so? Yes or no? This is also an energy machine, on top of it we put mechanical parts to it. Even if all the mechanical parts are intact, if there is no energy, this will not function. So from looking deep inside, we understood we could create an energetic machine without mechanical parts, because if mechanical parts come, they need a certain level of maintenance and servicing and works. But if you just create an energy machine, it will simply function day and night. Suppose your motorcycle or your car or whatever you use, let's say your phone was just an energy machine without mechanical parts. See, it's happening. From such a big phone, it's slowly becoming smaller, smaller. With less and less mechanical parts, it's becoming more and more efficient. Why do you think? Slowly it is moving towards a space where it is becoming more energetic than mechanical. Isn't it so? Do you remember old James Bond movies? Such a big phone. Ah, it was looking like a just born baby. <laughs> but today, it's become this much as they're expecting in another probably ten, fifteen years, your phone can be just imprinted on your hand. Simply like this, you can speak. Or you don't even have to do this. If you simply do that, it will say what you wanted to say. So from being mechanical, now we are going towards energy-based machine. From a huge earth mover to a computer, this is the big difference, that it's more energetic and less mechanical. So we created energy machines, which in this culture we called as deities, or the English word is deity. Generally we call them as murtis, that means a form. A form which has a certain ability to do certain things, energetic forms. So some different forms are like windows to the existence, you could open up different dimensions. All this is forgotten, made into absolute nonsense today in the form of superstitions, but otherwise it was clearly prescribed. Because today people get identified with this or that, they think they, their gods are about belonging to them. No, these deities, God is the wrong word for this, these are deities or murtis, these were created for a specific purpose. If you want intelligence, you go to one kind of deity, if you have fear problems, you go to another kind of deity, you have love issues, you go to another kind of deity, you have prosperity issues, you go to another kind of deity. Like this, they made energetic forms, which you must learn to use. These are not places of prayer. These are not places of worship, these are places where you learn 
how to use the machine for your benefit. They were built in various forms and various capacities. They were also connected to people's genetic information, which we called as Kuladaivas, where only for that genetic pool it will work. This is a very complex process. So Ramanujam comes from the south. Why I'm specially mentioning the south is, if these things were there everywhere in the country, but the northern belt of this nation has taken too many invasions, too much disruption. South <laughs> we, you know, south of India, so we've been very well protected. Even today we maintain many things. We never had major disruptions as the north had. Because of this, certain sciences are still alive and active which could produce a Ramanu Ramanujam. Ramanujam spoke about black holes nearly a hundred years ago or more than hundred years ago, when there was no concept of black holes. He made mathematics for black holes when there was no concept of black holes. Science always progresses like this, first the concept, then the theory and then the mathematics. But he made the mathematics first before there was a concept, before there was a theory. And when… when they asked him… he was sitting on his deathbed and simply pouring out mathematics, notebooks and notebooks of mathematics, simply pouring out. People asked, where is this coming from? What is this? He said, my Devi bleeds mathematics. So now we open the floor to the audience for asking the questions and uh, first we'll have questions from uh, this side of the floor. Namaskaram Sadhguru. How come you got a better microphone than me, huh? <laughs> um, my name is Azim. I'm a first year student uh, pursuing BCom honors. So uh, basically we all know that uh, at this age we get into a relationship, then we broke up. Uh, so there was one of my friend uh, recently who broke up and he was like, he asked me to give him some advice on how to move on and how to cope up with things. So being of the same age, I cannot advise him because I don't know how to move on. So my question is that how to move on after that situation Well, somebody else has moved on. Even if you stay in the same place, distance will happen. <laughs> See, let us understand this in terms of life, not in terms of trend, not in terms of morality, not in terms of right and wrong, but in terms of life. When I say in terms of life, Azim, do you remember how your great, 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 ten generations ago, how your grandfather looked like? No. No. But his nose is sitting on your face. Yes, yes. or no? Yes. Yes. So is it true that your body has a tremendous amount of memory? Hmm? Yes. This memory is on many different levels. There is an evolutionary memory, there is a genetic memory, there is a karmic memory, there are conscious levels of memory and unconscious levels of memories, articulate and inarticulate levels of memories. But if your great-grandfather's nose has to sit on your face, obviously your body is carrying a very complex mechanism of memory, isn't it? Yes. So this body, if it is capable of such a complex sense of memory, you think it is not gathering memory with whatever you touch and feel and relate with? You yeah. think or… you think so or no? Yes. It does. So it is gathering an enormous amount of memory. This is how you know. See, how to go up the steps? How to go down the steps? It looks very simple, but it's not simple, it's very complex. Your body has to remember. Otherwise, it cannot go up 
and go down so simply. Well, today the sports people are talking about muscle memory, building memory into their system so that the sport can be executed at a certain level of efficiency. So this is not only for sport, this is not only for specific activity, every day you are imbibing so much memory and this memory, if there is a certain kind of congruence to this memory, if there's a certain kind of cohesive… cohesiveness to this memory, this memory will become productive. If there is a certain sense of chaos to this memory, if there is a certain level of chaos to this memory, then you may know everything but this memory will work against you because it's contradictory and conflicting within itself. When you say a relationship and when your friend asks you this question, the question itself is coming because it matters, isn't it? Yes. If you didn't matter, you could have just forgotten about it and gone on like old pair of shoes. But it matters because you invested your thought, your emotion and maybe even your body. Once you've invested these three things, there is a profound sense of memory about that. If you create lot of contradictory memory in your system, you will see life will tell later that you will have everything but you feel like you have nothing because it's confused and it's joyless, it doesn't have exuberance. It's very important young people understand the mechanism of what you have been given. If this was just a lump of flesh, you could have done whatever the hell you want with it, but this is a very sophisticated machine. If you treat it sensitively, it can do things in a phenomenal way, otherwise it'll do mediocre things. Suppose I gave you, let's say you know nothing about computers, I gave you, let's say, Apple Air, have you seen this model? Yeah. Very thin and sharp. I gave you this but you don't know what it is, you took it home and started chopping cucumbers. It works very well, <laughs> it works very well. But isn't it a tragedy that you're using a computer to chop cucumber? Nothing wrong with a cucumber, but something definitely wrong with you, isn't it? Yes. Hello? Yes. yes. Something very fundamentally wrong with you when you do not understand the significance of what you have on your hands, all significant things will go waste. So, before not just other human beings, I'm saying before you touch, involve yourself in anything, you must see what is the level of involvement you wish, you must see where do you want to take this, you must also see what are the different impacts it will have upon you, whether this will work well for this life or work against this life, you must consider Otherwise, you will become a lose life. Lose, I'm not using the word lose in terms of morality, I'm just talking about lose in terms of not able to fulfill the direction in which you wish to go in your life. Bringing some integrity to this, intellectual integrity, emotional integrity and physical integrity to your life is very, very important. Well, beyond that, if something goes wrong, you just have to understand when you came alone, when you were born, you came alone and when you die, you will go alone. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, this girl, she can't live without asking the question, please give it to her <laughs> Namaskaram, I am Shraddha Sadhguru. Uh, my question is, um, I am pursuing science. And when I talk about uh, yoga and doing Shambhavi in my college, people look, kind of look down upon me saying, you are a science student, how can you <laughs> talk about these things? How can you live sensibly? <laughs> and so, I, in my first year, I used to feel very bad about it, but then I just left it. Now I have a question as to why there is such resistance in the youth about our own sciences. I mean, Indian sciences have been established by a deep understanding of everything. Why is there a resistance? And is… if 
I mean, is it important that we convert this resistance into acceptance or at least, you know, tell them not to disregard it without having explored it in, it com in its complete sense? And if so, how do we integrate inner sciences into the current education system that is in place? Thank you so much. See, we have a... Unfortunately, today, we have a very... a constipated perception of what is science or what is scientific. Essentially, the way the science or the scientific process is defined is, something is considered as a science if there is a systematic approach to it, and the approach should be repeatable, and the approach should work not just for me, should work for many people, then it is considered a science. So science is fundamentally physics, but there are other sciences which have evolved out of it. Biological studies are there, psychological stu studies are there, social sciences are there. So anything which has a systematic approach and is applicable not just to one person, but to a larger number of people, becomes a science or a scientific approach. In that sense, there is no science which is a larger application except physics. There is no other science or even physics. There is no other science which is as largely applicable as yogic sciences. It is just that the yoga that people have heard about today is a rebound from the American coast. So they think yoga means wearing lulu pants, and going around is a kind of a fashion. No, yoga means this. I want you to listen to this carefully because this is not uh, something that you can explore in a casual atmosphere like this. Yoga means, literally means union. What does union mean? The very body that you carry right now. One day somebody is going to bury you or burn you. Smoking or non-smoking, we will do it. Yes or no? Either we do this or that, will you become part of the earth? Hello? How come now you are not part of it, I'm asking? You even now you are part of it, isn't it? You are just a small outcrop of this earth. Only because you were given the ability to be mobile, you lost your sense, you thought you are a world by yourself. If you were stuck like a tree, I'm sure you would have understood you're part of the earth, isn't it? Just because the planet gave you the freedom to move, how stupid we became. It's not just with body, it is so with the entire universe. It is not just with the physical form, so with every aspect of you. So yoga means union. What it means by saying union is, it is a science of how to obliterate the boundaries of your individuality so that you become a much larger life than what you are right now. Either you can live here as a constipated life. When I say a constipated life, constipation means it happens little by little. That's constipation. Hello? Right now for most people, life is happening little by little. You ask them, what are the great moments in their life? They say, when I passed my examination, I felt great, then I was miserable, then I found a job, I felt great, but then it, you know, all the people made me miserable. Then I got married, it was really wonderful, then my mother-in-law came and phew, she did it. She didn't come, she was there before your husband. She was there all the time, she was there before you and before your men. But like this it goes on, they will count five things where they had great moments in their life, this is a constipated life, that every moment of your life is not an exuberant outburst of life. It is once in a way something happens to you, constipated or no? No, you must say yes or no. Do you want to live a constipated life? If you have to live an exuberant life, the boundaries of your individuality have to go to whatever extent. Only then you capture a larger amount of life 
and you have a larger experience of life, a higher level of exuberance than what you normally see around you. Have you blown soap bubbles when you were at least uh, young? When you were young? Did you blow? <laughs> ah! Did you blow soap bubbles? At least when you were children? So you got only this much big bubble, but somebody else got that big bubble. Same soap, but somebody blows this big bubble, yours is only this much. Why do you think? Hello? You also have a lung full of air, you also have soap, but one person gets this big bubble, another person gets this big bubble. Why do you think it happens? Because if you want to expand boundaries, if you want to expand boundaries, what is important is not the desire. What is important is you need to capture that much air in that limited possibility. Then it becomes this big. Similarly this one. See, my body and your body are different. This is me, that is you. Till we bury, we don't understand, it's all the same earth. But right now, this is my body, that is your body, one hundred percent clear. This is my mind and that's your mind, hundred percent clear. This can't be that, that can't be this. But there is no such thing as my life and your life. There is just life. How much life you capture, determines the scope and scale of your life. Not how much information you capture, how much life you capture will determine the scope and scale of your life. So if this has to happen, you have to breach the concretized boundaries of your individuality and push it. When the boundaries are dissolved, then we say you are in yoga. If one experiences the dissolution, then we refer to that person as a yogi. Well, how far each individual is going to go is subject to various realities. But at least, should you not make an effort, a scientific and focused effort, as to how to breach these boundaries of individuality which we ourselves created? Hello? All your boundaries are created by you, isn't it? You create the boundary and you suffer the boundary, what kind of life is that? If nature created the boundary and you're suffering that, that's understandable. You create your own boundary because of self-preservation. In pursuit of self-preservation, you build walls. These walls of self-preservation will become walls of self-imprisonment. If you don't want that, you need yoga. Oh, should I twist? Should I turn? Should I stand on my head? No, yoga does not mean twisting, turning. You can breathe and do yoga, you can walk and do yoga, you can talk and do yoga, you can read and do yoga, you can sleep and do yoga, you can stand and do yoga, you can do yoga in whichever way. There is no specific activity, it's a certain dimension. What is the dimension, unfortunately, once it goes to United States, they will reduce it into a specific activity and lulu, lulu lemon pants you have to wear. Otherwise, no yoga. People keep ask, asking me, even yesterday somebody asked me, Sadhguru, how many hours of yoga sanas do you do? I said, twenty seconds. What? Only twenty seconds? Yes. Actually, it's true. I do only twenty seconds of sadhana every day. I wake up in the morning, if I sit up, just one twenty seconds, I'm done. Then I don't do yoga rest of the day. No, I live yoga because my entire life is to constantly wipe away the boundaries within myself and within everybody else. This is yoga. What we're doing here is yoga right now. We'll be taking two more questions. So, hello sir, uh, myself Shudipto Das. So, I saw one of your videos on Where what a twenty-year-old should do in life. There you asked us to take a few days off 
uninfluenced by anybody and think what is needed the most for the universe. But also you added to keep aside uh, the compulsions, uh, to keep aside the things uh, that are coming due to our immediate compulsions. So suppose my immediate compulsions are uh, food, shelter and like to get self-sufficiency. Uh, so how do I keep them aside and do something as important as uh, say gender equality? Oh, what is that? What do you do about gender equality? If you don't do anything, the girls will prove they're equal. No, uh, I, like I feel that there should be gender equality and in this stage of the world, uh, such situation is not present. No, no, what I'm saying is you don't have to do anything about gender equality. If you don't mess with the girls, they will prove they're equal. Unfortunately, many times they will prove they're little more than you. No, I, I, I don't know how these two things are linked, but you're talking about what I said that before you take major steps in your life, you must move to a place where you're not influenced by your peers, by your elders, by your parents, by your teachers. Spend some time upon yourself, what is it that I want to do with this life? This life. Do not understand life as job, food, profession, this, that nonsense. This is life, isn't it? Hello? You are mistaking the accessories of life as life, unfortunately. Today if people say, my life, we are supposed to understand they're talking about their car, they're talking about their home, they're talking about their wife or husband, they're talking about their dog. No, this is life. These are all accessories of life. Once the accessories of life become more significant than life itself, oh, you are finished, okay? Whatever you do, you'll be messed. So I said withdraw from all the influences that you have, spend at least a few days upon… if you think you're a worthwhile life, if you think you're a worthwhile life, it deserves attention, isn't it? This life deserves attention. You spend a few days looking at if all these people were not there telling you a thousand things as to what you should do, what is it that you really want to do? You must look at it, isn't it? People come to me and tell me, they've been married for thirty-five years. Sadhguru, I knew I made a mistake with this marriage. Then I ask, is it really? Then how did you get these three children? <laughs> marriage was a mistake, you should could have stopped right there. How did three children have… No, Sadhguru, you know, I, I know <laughs> how that happens. But then uh, how did you build this big house, this nonsense and all the… Tra you know, all the things you're beginning to suffer now, unfortunately. You're not enjoying them, you're suffering them. So how did you do all this? Uh, no, Sadhguru, you know, mistake, 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 mistake. Why you're a serial mistake? Because you don't stop and look, what is it that this real life really cares for beyond social pressures, beyond teachings, beyond all kinds of diktats that come from everywhere, what is it that this life wants? Every human being must look at it. Every human being must look at it, it's everybody's right to look at it, beyond all the pressures. Someone please, that's it. This will be the last question for the day. Namaskaram Sadhguru. I'm Lavanya, I'm studying economics honors first year, I'm from Hyderabad. Um, despite being surrounded by so many people, we still lack that feeling of belonging to somebody, being accepted by somebody, being loved by somebody. How should we deal with that discontent and loneliness? Hey, man, di, Hyderabad ni cuci. Hah? Hah? 
这样。You must understand this. Right now, in these two hours, we are speaking two different tongues. On one level, many questions are aimed towards how can I be free from this and that. Another level, you are asking how can I bind myself to something or somebody. You must decide. What is the highest value in your life, freedom or bondage? Please, I would like to hear that word. Eh? Oh, freedom! But if you are free, you feel lost. If, some, if you go into the mountains and you're totally free, that is, nobody around, nothing around, you're just in the empty, space of the mountains, you don't feel free, you think you're lost. So to handle freedom, it needs a certain clarity and strength. Most people cannot handle freedom. They are always trying to bind, my, bind themselves, but only talking, mouthing freedom all the time. If you really set them free, they will suffer immensely. So this is a evolutionary issue, you know. In the sense, human beings are right now like this, a caged bird, if you keep a bird caged for a long period of time and then one day you took off the door of the cage, still the bird won't fly. From inside it will protest that it's not free, but it will not fly. Human condition is just that. For all other creatures, nature has drawn two lines within which they have to live and die, and that's what they do. But only for human beings, there's only bottom line, there's no top line, and that's what they're suffering. If their life was also fixed, like every other creature's life, they wouldn't be stressed, they wouldn't be anxious, they wouldn't be struggling how to handle their own intelligence. And that is what you're seeking unknowingly. You may seek it in the form of relationships, you may seek it in the form of profession, you may seek it in the form of, form of nationality, ethnicity, community. God, heaven, hell, all you're trying to do is draw an artificial line which does not exist. Because freedom needs courage. Freedom needs a certain madness. If you're very sane, you cannot be free because you will go between the two lines of logic. To be free, it takes a lot of strength that if you… First of all, what needs to happen if you want to be free is… Do you understand that all human experience has a chemical basis to it? Hello? What you call as joy is one kind of chemistry, misery is another kind of chemistry, stress is one kind of chemistry, anxiety another kind of chemistry, agony one kind of chemistry, ecstasy another kind of chemistry, at least ecstasy you know it's another kind of chemistry. I hear. <laughs> so your experience of life has a chemical basis to it. This is a more superficial way of looking at it, there are other dimensions to it but for your understanding. Or in other words, what you call as myself right now, you're a chemical soup. The question is only, are you a great soup or a lousy soup? Yes or no? Right now, if you have a chemistry of blissfulness, <laughs> if you close your eyes, it's fantastic, if you open your eyes, it's fantastic, if somebody is here, it's fantastic, nobody is here, it's very fantastic. Yes or no? but you have a lousy chemistry. If you look at them, if they smile at you, it's nice, not fantastic. If they look at you like this, suddenly it's a problem. If these people are happening just the way you want, your chemistry is reasonably balanced. If they do something that you don't like, boom, it goes somewhere else. So essentially, you have not looked at this mechanism what is the basis of this, how it functions, how I can make it function at its highest level. Right now, let's say you really blissed out like me. Do you care who is around, who is not around? If they're around, it's fantastic. They're gone, 
Fantastic! Because your experience of life is no more determined by what you have and what you don't have, whether it's people or things or food or this or that, it is not determined by that. Once your way of being is not determined by anything outside of you, then there is no such thing as loneliness. But you will enjoy your aloneness because whether you like it or you don't like it, at this young age it's a little uh, difficult to understand this, whether you like it or you don't like it, within this body you're always alone, isn't it? Whether you do interaction or intercourse or whatever, 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 still you're alone in this body, yes or no? Hello? If you don't learn how to handle this aloneness, you have not learned anything about life. This is the most beautiful thing. The most beautiful thing about life is, nobody can get here, it's just my space. Yes or no? Isn't this the most beautiful thing? Nobody can invade me. They can capture me, they can torture me, they can do so many things, but they cannot invade me because I have a space which is just my own. Isn't this the most wonderful aspect of your life? Don't suffer that, that is the most beautiful thing. Oh, but you want to pine little romantically and enjoy that, uh, what? What are those songs, huh? popular songs? Pining for somebody. Without you, I cannot exist. Most of the songs are that way now. Sing one song, huh? Older ones, older ones. I'm horrible at singing. Huh? I'm horrible at singing. Just tell me the words, I will sing. You… you saying it to me? Okay, okay, I got it. Sri Ram is a singer. Sri Ram? That song, what is saying? Hum tere bin ab reh nahi sakte Tere bina kya vajud mera See, all the boys must learn songs like this, otherwise you can't floor the girls. But the girls should understand, the guy has a need and he's doing this, it's not really true, but let's enjoy the game right now. Because what we do is just a certain it's a certain game, life is, because it comes to an end. But the important thing is, how are you within yourself? If you are here in such a way that you are only driven by your needs, you will live a very meager life. But if you can sit here without any need, but you will do whatever is needed, then you will live a magnificent life. It's my wish and my blessing. Every one of you must have a fantastic life, make it happen for yourself.